about this. Chris, welcome back. Thank you, good to be back.
Well, my, my brother's there. So. Oh, yeah. uh, right. Some, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm surprised you're not flying with the plane. Yeah, yeah, they are. So who wants to do it? It's not, it's not November anymore. <laughs> I changed it before I put it on the stick. Thank you. 
Yeah, it's just one that then that didn't have any sensitivity. Well, it's just a front set. Yeah, it's a back set. So then, as it goes further, the front set is embraced. Okay, let's get started. So it's a pleasure today to have uh, with us Phil Marshall, who is visiting from Santa Barbara. Uh, so Phil uh, started his career in uh, Cambridge in the UK, where he did his PhD, then he moved up to uh, Stanford to work with uh, Roger Blanford, and uh, he's now uh, doing his second postdoc at the uh, University of Santa Barbara, and he's going to tell us today about uh, how to find uh, strong gravitational lenses in our service. Thank you. Very nice to be back. Um, for those of you who were at the workshop in the summer, this is a little bit of a sort of update on uh, what I've been doing, but for the rest of you it's all new and uh, exciting. Okay, so I'll give you a bit of introduction about um, strong lenses and the science we're uh, doing with them, a bit of a case study, but then spend most of the time telling you about um, uh, a robot we've been building at, at UCSB and at KIPAC to, to try and find new lenses in, in optical imaging surveys. Uh, so really I'm looking forward to uh, uh, this sort of uh, new era of wide field optical imaging and uh, trying to find uh, lenses and then use them in that. But we're starting now with the, with the software development, if you like. So for, for this crowd, maybe the thing to watch out for is the uh, opportunities for theorists that uh, might come along with things like PANSTARS and, and LSST, possibly uh, JDEM as well. All right, so here are the people I've been working with on the, the Haggles project. <coughs> mainly with uh, David Hogg for the, the robot. But we also have a student who's searching for strings. If you're interested in cosmic strings, then I can show you some stuff we've been doing on that uh, later. Now also, uh, Ellie Newton is a very good student we've, we've had uh, working on testing the robot in the, the SLACS uh, survey data. All right, so what is strong gravitational lensing? Uh, I'm sure you all know this, but just to recap, if you have a, a bright source lying behind a... a a massive object like a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies. Uh, if the source is lined up just right, you can have the light coming around one of two ways or maybe, uh, maybe more, such that when you uh, observe it here, you see an image up there, an image down here, multiple images of the same object. So this is strong lensing, multiple imaging. Uh, most of the time, the source is a faint blue galaxy, just because that's what most of the uh, background objects in the universe are. But occasionally, you find quasars, and uh, we can hope to see more exotic things like supernovae. And the uh, parameters of the, of the lens, we can, we can infer from uh, measurements of where the images are and how bright they are and so on. And all this comes from, from modeling. So here are some models for strong lenses. It's the, uh, the best response I had to this picture was from, from Neil when I showed it to him first. <laughs> we don't actually do our modeling like this. So here's an example of, uh, of, of how we uh, go about measuring mass and uh, other interesting things uh, with strong lenses. Here's an image from uh, Ket taken with, um, uh, with the infrared camera with the laser guard star reductive optics system turned on. And uh, what you see in the middle is a bright uh, elliptical galaxy with a system of arcs around it. If we subtract off the lens galaxy light, you can see the arcs quite nicely here. This is two images merging together. This is the other two images, and this is all one background uh, faint, blue, faint blue galaxy. So what we do is we make a simple model of the lens and of the source and uh, use the two to predict the image that, that we see. So here's our best prediction for the image and you can see it matches quite well with the, uh, the data once we've subtracted off the lens. And uh, small uh, residuals and here's uh, the model source in the, in the source plane. So what can we do with this? Well, if we have uh, HST data as well as the, the Keck infrared data, we can uh, model the, model the uh, or measure the structural parameters of the source uh, in the four different filters. That's what this plot is showing here. This is effective radius of this little faint uh, blue galaxy. And this is the Sursich index up here. And you can see that, roughly speaking, we're measuring about the same size and about the same Sursich index in all filters. This is all clustering around the index of one. So we can also measure the, the brightness of the source in each of the four filters. And here it is, uh, the inferred flux plotted as a function of wavelength. And then we can fit SEDs to it and try and figure out something about the stellar population and measure the stellar mass. So why are we doing all of this? Well, uh, it's interesting to, to measure the sizes of galaxies. We have some uh, predictions and, and models and so on for how 
uh, disk galaxies form and what size they should have relative to their mass. It turns out that the source behind uh, 0737 is uh, smaller and uh, less massive than the typical galaxies you see in HST surveys. And that's just because we have this uh, lens sitting in front of it that allows us to magnify the, the source and measure uh, this tiny little object very accurately. So this is uh, an object at redshift point 6 where these HST surveys have been, uh, been uh, looked at. If we instead plot it at, uh, on a uh, plot compared to redshift zero galaxies, you can see that it sits in this cloud of dwarf ellipticals that live in the Virgo cluster. So the idea is that this little blob, which looks the same in all filters, has a sort of recent starburst uh, SED and a uh, surcage index of about one looks the same as the dwarf ellipticals in the universe today. So it might be a, uh, one of these dwarf ellipticals forming at redshift point six. Anyway, the point is that lenses allow us to uh, look at much smaller objects with the lensing effect and allow us to do very accurate measurements. <coughs> okay, so all projects like this would benefit if we had a bigger sample. And the current uh, state of the art is the SLAC survey. This is uh, uh, candidate lenses selected from uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey as, as red galaxies that have uh, spurious emission lines. So here's a spectrum of... Uh, of an LRG, and you can see that there are these extra emission lines that are consistent with uh, an object lying at a much higher redshift. And when you uh, follow these up with HST, what you find are um, systems of blue arcs lying around uh, elliptical galaxies. So what can, you, what can you tell from a sample of maybe 70 or so? Uh, well, here are some earlier plots from a, from a smaller subsample, but the results haven't changed since then. What you find is when you measure the um, uh, the mass distribution with lensing and compare it to the, to the mass you get from the velocity dispersion of the stars, you can make a, a rough uh, density profile. And you find that all of the lenses in the SLAC sample have roughly isothermal profiles. And in fact, if you then try and look at this um, uh, density profile slope, this is uh, minus two for isothermal, as a function of redshift, then it doesn't seem to be changing much. So this is something interesting about massive galaxies. Um, it's not at all clear why the stellar and the dark mass should arrange themselves into this, uh, into this uh, isothermal profile overall. All right, so that was a challenge for, for theorists, but if we want to extend this uh, observational study, then, uh, well, here are some, some clues. Here are the SLAX objects, um, and they're arranged in order of redshift. So you can see that down here, there are only four that are at redshift 0.4. So if we want higher redshift lenses, then we can we need to do something other than look in the Sloan spectra. <coughs> also, you can see that, that the sample is big enough that you're starting to see more, uh, more interesting kinds of lenses, like uh, lenses that have big disks. Uh, but there's only 10 of them so far, so we might try and find a way of finding more disk-like lenses so we can study disk galaxies. <coughs> All right, so where are these uh, higher redshift, lower mass, strong lenses going to come from? Well, here's, a, here's an idea. Uh, if you were able to build a something like uh, the HST, uh, but with a wide field camera on it so you could do a survey, uh, then that would be excellent for finding new strong lenses. Uh, we've learned an awful lot from HST about the, the structure of the lenses we do have, but this is something that could maybe uh, find a lot more of them. Unfortunately, the, the design of JDEM is un, in a bit of a state of flux at the moment, but if it was built to the SNAP design, then it would be excellent. What is the current plan? I mean, like to have like Yeah, the, the reference mission is looking like uh, infrared dominated imaging, but with fewer, bigger pixels. So it's really looking like it's more optimized for baryon oscillations than it is for wide field imaging. The argument is that for, for weak lensing, you perhaps don't need such good resolution as we have with HST. If you have the ground-based colors for photometric redshifts, then you... Anyway, that's the argument. If you don't like this, by the way, there's, there's a comments page you can write. <laughs> you can say, we'd really like something more like HST, please. Okay. So uh, I started the project to answer the specific question, how would we go about finding something like 10,000 new gravitational lenses uh, with something like JDEM, where here JDEM is a HST-like telescope, but that has a wide field of view, different optics, and can do a survey of, say, 1,000 or more square degrees and go very deep from space. 
So most of these 10,000 lenses are going to be uh, like the SLAX lenses. There'll be m massive galaxies with faint blue galaxies behind them. Okay, so we can optimize our search then for, uh, for things like this. We can pick out, try and pick out massive elliptical galaxies and then uh, subtract away the light just as we did with 0737 and then ask, does the pattern of residuals uh, agree with, uh, with a, a lens model? The reason for doing this is if you uh, consider trying to do this by hand or at least by undergraduate, um, then it turns out to take an awful long time and cost a lot of money. So you need an automated method to, to make that more efficient. Also, if you have an uh, automated, automated way of finding lenses, then you can run it many times, you can tweak the parameters, you can understand the selection function of the lenses uh, so, considerably so better. Undergraduate is one key a week. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It, it includes overhead, that's right. <laughs> we should talk afterwards. <laughs> Actually, uh, Neil Jackson in the UK has been doing a, a search for lenses in the Cosmos survey. I'll talk a bit more about the HST archive uh, in a minute, but he, he did this visual inspection of all bright galaxies. He looked at 300,000 objects, and it took him, I don't know, a few days or so. And I asked him, how big would your sample have had to be before you gave it to a team of undergraduates? And he said, if there were a million, he would have given it to undergrads. So he, he hit his limit of a few hundred thousand. OK, so once we've found all our um, massive uh, galaxies, <coughs> we can make cutouts and then look at these uh, patterns of blue residuals. And the idea is to model everything as if it was a lens and then see how well we do. So what we do is uh, uh, we make a simple model that predicts the, uh, the image and then we can calculate the goodness of fit of our predicted image to the, to the observed image. Um, but we can also spit out more than just this statistic. We can try and work out what, how uncertain we are about the mass of the galaxy or the Einstein radius of the galaxy. Uh, we can also ask how bright is the source or how unique is the model. And so with these uh, four bits of information, we then have to figure out, um, is this a lens or not? So for example, here are some massive galaxies from the uh, HST EGS survey. Uh, one of them is a lens, and two of them are not. But all of them have residuals once you subtract away uh, a smooth model for the lens light that could be uh, interpreted as, as being due to lensing. And so we take these input images and give them to a, a modeling part of the robot. And here's a plot showing, as you vary the Einstein radius of the lens, uh, how much flux do you successfully trace back to the same position in the, uh, in the source plane. So we end up with this uh, model for the source, and this is our predicted image. And then the question is, how well does this match this? <coughs> OK, so the robot tells you, uh, uh, produces these four bits of information that uh, somehow quantify the lensiness. Uh, it turns out that answering the question, uh, is this object a gravitational lens or not, is, is rather difficult. And the reason is that we understand well what lenses look like, but we don't understand well what non-lenses look like. So those examples I showed you before have complex spiral structure that are not easily quantified. So it turns out that it's much easier to ask this question. What classification parameter H would a human inspector have given this candidate if they had looked at it? And the reason this is well defined is because we can uh, train the robot using humans. OK, so here are some simulated lenses that where we uh, uh, can use to, to train the robot in, in what a, a lens looks like. What we do is we, we take a sample of uh, 100 of these and also 100 uh, objects that are not lenses and get the modeler to produce its four data points and then compare the distributions of those data points according to whether it really was a lens or it really wasn't a lens. What do I mean by that? Well, here's a plot of a four-dimensional probability distribution. This one here, the probability of getting the robot's uh, data points, given the true value of H. So all of those simulated lenses and the, and the, sim and the real non-lenses were looked at by me, and I assigned them 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, or 3, according to whether I thought they were a lens or not. So for the ones that I thought were definitely lenses, here is what the robot says for its four outputs. Each of these points is a, is, a, is a system, and these are the four dimensions. It doesn't matter that you can't read the axes. The only thing that matters is 
that when I repeat the experiment with the uh, systems that I think are definitely not lenses, the contours are different. Right, so this is a summary of what the robot understands uh, about its outputs. Okay, so that, that probability distribution was this one. If we want to get the, uh, the distribution for the classification parameter given the data, then we have to multiply by uh, this thing here, and then we might choose as our final classification number the, the posterior mean. Um, but there's a question here, what do we use for this prior probability distribution? And the answer is that if a human was doing this, then they would factor in how rare gravitational lenses really are. And so it makes sense to, to tell the robot about this as well. If we say that a priori we give a very high probability to something not being a lens and a low probability to something actually being a lens, we can then uh, run the robot and see how well its classifications agree with my classifications. So here are plots of completeness and purity. Uh, this is the, I always get this wrong, completeness is the, the fraction of uh, real lenses that the robot actually classified as lenses. Um, so in, ideally, we'd like this to be uh, all black along this axis, where this is robot classification parameter against human classification parameter. We'd like this to be all black along the diagonal and white either side. And you can see it's not. We're only 20% complete in this bin up here, which is the most important one. These are the ones that uh, both me and the robot agree are, uh, are real lenses. We can see in the purity, we do uh, uh, much better. This is close to being black along the diagonal. And what it's saying is that the, the sample of, of, of objects that the robot thinks are lenses is quite small and is incomplete, but it's really quite pure. 100% is out of two objects? No, the number in brackets okay. is the number per square degree you would expect to find. So this is good in the sense that per square degree we only have to look at two objects. Whereas down here you can see there's something like 10,000 candidates to look at. All right. I have some collaborators that are a bit more optimistic about whether things are lenses or not, so we could ask the robot to be optimistic as well and give it this prior. And then something interesting happens. You, you find that you're much more uh, uh, complete in the bin that you really care about, but it's very impure. And what that means is, is that if you want to, uh, with this particular robot, if you want to find all the lenses in your uh, survey, it means that you can't get around um, having to inspect uh, fairly large numbers of objects. Okay, so what does this mean for SNAP? Well, it means that we could, we could do the analysis on the, uh, the SNAP or the JDEM images uh, today with this sort of simple first attempt at a, at a robot and discover 2,000 out of 10,000 lenses without having to do uh, any human inspection at all. Um, but that you could do a 90% complete sample by just looking at 7% of the bright red galaxies. So this is good. Um, but if we want to set this robot to work now, well, first we have to find a suitable data set for it to work on, and then you might guess that that data set is going to be quite small, and we'd, we'd rather have a very complete survey than a very pure one. Um, so this is the sorry situation that I've been in for the last few years with the HST archive. So, yeah, we are searching the entire HST ACS imaging archive for uh, galaxy-scale gravitational lenses. Um, and the idea here is that this is the, the only precursor data set for JDEM, so we should try and get the most of it out of it as we can. Um, but it's interesting, the HST archive, because it consists mainly of fields uh, observed for some other reason other than lens finding. So it's fields around clusters of galaxies or individual galaxies or GRBs. So you can see that you'll get a range of, of different gravitational lens environments, different density environments. So what we do is we've selected, uh, or what we have done, is... Uh, uh, select all the multi-filter fields, fields that have, uh, it's usually I and V, um, but we want at least two bands and we ask for uh, relatively deep exposures. And then we make the, the deepest possible image, uh, taking care to do the, the registration and so on. Um, and then uh, run the robot on that. We have some collaborators who are doing, uh, or want to do weak lensing in the archive, so this helps with the image quality. At the moment we're 90% uh, finished with the data processing, and, and these images will go back to the, the HST legacy archive this year. So if you want to do your own crazy project looking for rare objects in the archive, then this might be useful for you. 
Okay, so let me show you some preliminary results from the first three quarters of a square degree. Here are our images, looking for lenses. So you can see we have quite a number of fields that have very bright nearby objects in, but there's all this sky around it that might have a lens in it. We do some mosaicing, uh, most of it looks like this. Okay, so from this three quarters of a square degree we find 10,000 bright red galaxies and throw them all to the, uh, to the robot after we've done this uh, selection. Here's the uh, color, uh, color magnitude selection for bright red things. These are uh, uh, tracks through redshift. And you can see that we should be sensitive to all uh, um, things with uh, elliptical galaxy type SEDs up to around redshift one or so. But because it's the archive, we have to do this not in just one pair of filters, but all of these pairs of filters. All right, and finally get to uh, give these uh, 10,000 candidates to the, uh, to the robot. So in optimistic mode, it gives us uh, uh, 4,000 candidates th to inspect. So these are things that it thinks are either probably lenses or definitely lenses. And we're going to disagree with it most of the time, but it should contain everything uh, that we're interested in. OK, so here's what we find. Here are our um, sort of best 15 uh, uh, human-selected uh, lens candidates. And you can see there's some, uh, some nice objects here. You might not be convinced by all of them. Maybe this helps a little bit when you subtract off the lens line. So are, are they all new lenses? Now it turns out these two were uh, targeted for the Castles program. So this was a program to look for or to observe with HST uh, the um, lensed quasars. It turns out these two are the, are the ones that have uh, least point-like sources. And remember our robot was designed to find uh, faint blue galaxies lensed into rings and arcs and so on. So it turns out the robot doesn't do very well at very bright point-like quasars, but as soon as the source gets more extended, it can pick them out. All the rest are new though. So here are some more. These are the ones that um, look obviously disky. So you can see that uh, there's quite a common uh, lensing effect here where you have a bright arc around the, at one end of a uh, edge-on disk galaxy. So we're demodeling these at the moment to see whether these really are consistent with the uh, naked cusp lens configuration, but they certainly look quite convincing. So you see that we don't do very well with subtracting the lens light here. We probably need a better model for the disk component here to get rid of it. What's the scale to the this? So all of these are six arc second cutouts. So they're all galaxy scale by design. <coughs> so one other thing you might notice about these lenses is that uh, many of them have very faint sources. So it's not clear how useful these are going to be. If you try and get spectroscopic redshifts for these to try and measure the uh, absolute mass, it's going to take quite a long time even on a big telescope. Maybe for the brighter ones we can do it, but the fainter ones we, we don't. So this is reminding us that if we try and do this kind of science with something like JDEM, we're really reliant on the photometric redshifts in, from the imaging to do our, our mass modeling. OK, so we find a surprising number of edge-on disks. Good. And it seems that um, uh, we might be sensitive to, to lower mass uh, uh, systems then, and perhaps at, at higher redshift. It's also true that the, the archive contains many cluster fields, and most of these, these lenses are actually in fields that were pointed at clusters of galaxies. So we're sort of taking advantage of the overdensity of galaxies here to, to find more lenses. Okay, so to make this a bit more quantitative, like do we really see uh, lower mass, higher redshift galaxies? Uh, we've uh, also run the robot on some fields where we have a bit more information about the, about the lenses. Uh, so the SLAX fields, these are HST observations of the, of the SLAX galaxies. That's a uh, two by two arc minutes squared around each lens. Uh, we can look in those fields for other elliptical galaxies that might be acting as lenses. Um, so this is uh, exploiting the, the clustering of elliptical galaxies to improve our yield. So we have 44 SLAX fields with deep ACS data. And Ellie Newton has... Uh, uh, run the robot on these these guys. So I get asked this a lot. I mean, how well does the, the robot do with the, with the SLAX lenses? Well, here's one. You can see that it's, it's very bright, much brighter than the typical galaxies in the archive. 
and that when you do your um, uh, lens light subtraction, you see that the sources are also very bright. And this is because of the, the Sloan spectroscopic uh, selection. You not only need a bright LRG here that you can take a spectrum of, but it's usually the case that the source is then not very high redshift either, also quite bright. And so these uh, lensed features are, are brighter than the ones we were seeing before. And what that means is that it, it's, uh, it's throwing something to the robot that it's not really expecting. So here you can see the same uh, probability distribution that I showed you before with the contours that the, the robot uses in its classification. And the colored dots are the slacks lenses. And you can see they tend to sort of cluster down at one end of the distribution. Right? They're, not some, they're not coming from the same distribution that the robot was trained on. So it does ra a little bit worse on selecting these as lenses than, than it would in with more typical imaging survey lenses. Okay, so here are the four lenses that Ellie found when she inspected the robot's output, uh, plus one extra candidate, which we're not really very sure about yet. And what she's done is um, to go and then look up as much as she can, much information as she can about these lens galaxies. Um, so she has the, in one case, the uh, velocity dispersion from the from the Sloan spectrum. In all cases, she has the photometric redshift for the for the lens galaxy. And so with that, she can start um, trying to in infer some more more physical things. She has the Sloan photometry that she can use with the fundamental plane to predict the velocity dispersion. And once you have a physical mass and you know the redshift of the lens, that means you can infer the redshift of the source from the lens model. So these are geometric redshifts for the sources behind these, uh, these uh, five candidate systems that she has. And you can see in the case where you know the lens redshift spectroscopically, uh, you do very well. And in other cases, you, you don't do quite as well, but you've still learned something. All right. So this is a plot of um, lens magnitude against lens redshift. And the open squares are the SLAC's uh, main lens galaxies, the, the spectroscopically selected lenses. And the blue ones are these new lenses that, that Ellie found. And you can see that they tend to be in associated with the higher redshift fields. Um, but also, at a given redshift, they tend to be uh, fainter. And this is uh, another way of plotting that. This is the, the velocity dispersion as predicted from the fundamental plane. And if you can compare the, the new lenses in blue, with the old lenses in, in the solid histogram, you can see that on average we're, we're probing lower mass lenses. Okay, so it seems that these imaging surveys um, are a good way of finding uh, the, the higher redshift lower mass lenses that, that we're interested in. Um, what, what we've done here is sort of a, a first attempt at a fully automated lens finder. There's still this element of human inspection needed because uh, the robot isn't able to get to 100% uh, completeness yet. Um, we found 20 new lenses uh, about, and they seem to be clustered and have uh, lower masses, uh, higher redshifts, as I say. So it's interesting to, to note that the, the kinds of lenses we find is, is determined by how we trained our robot. Our robot is a little bit stupid. It only knows about um, massive elliptical galaxies with, with faint blue galaxies around them. If we want to find different lenses again, then we'll, we'd need uh, a different kind of robot. But I think the, the principle will be the same which is that if you can successfully model an object as a gravitational lens, then it very likely is a gravitational lens. So the idea of needing spectroscopy to confirm something of a gravitational lens is something we can, we can do without, which is good because in these uh, uh, huge surveys, um, spectroscopy might well be too expensive anyway. All right, so just to finish up then. Uh, what, are the, uh, what can we do in the next few years uh, before something like JDEM flies? Well, we can search for more lenses um, in ground-based surveys. In particular, I'm interested in, in these two, uh, PanStars 1 and, uh, and later on LSST. So what are the properties of these things? Well, LSST is a, um, it's a high eton du survey telescope planned for about 2016 or so. Um, it's a eight meter telescope, but the middle part of the mirror is um, the tertiary uh, mirror. So you only get an effective six and a half meter effective aperture. And the optics are designed like this to get a very large field of, of view, 10 square degrees or so. And the idea is to go uh, wide and deep and fast all at the same, at the same time. So down to 24th magnitude in 30 seconds before moving to another patch. 
So this is a significant engineering challenge to make something that can slew around the sky so fast and keep, uh, keep the data coming. Um, but mapping the visible sky every four nights means that everything that you, you detect down to 24th magnitude, you have a good light curve for as well. So that would obviously be very, uh, very, very powerful survey, gives a lot of, uh, a lot of information. But as a precursor for that, uh, we can think about working on uh, PS1. This is the first uh, PanStars telescope. The advantage of this telescope is that it's already been built. Uh, it's taking data at the moment, and uh, it seems as though uh, it's, it's meeting its uh, specs of uh, getting to 20 seconds and a half in 60 seconds. And uh, it has not the same cadence as LSST, but, um, but interesting nonetheless in the sense that you get uh, on each particular field, you might get a, a two-month season for each of three years, and in, in that two-month period, you get maybe eight images across the, the, the filters. Uh, there's also a deeper survey planned uh, at sort of supernova cadence, but on a much, uh, much smaller field. All right, so here's an image taken by PS1. This is one field of view, uh, eight and a half uh, square degrees from the, the gigapixel camera. You can see that there's a few problems with the detectors, but basically it's looking in, in good shape. Although you notice that with an image this big, you can't tell at all what the image quality is. Uh, but it looks like it, it, it'll get to about a median of an arc second or so. All right, so what kinds of strong lenses uh, we, are we interested with, uh, with PS1 and LSST? Well, the, the galaxy galaxy lenses I showed you before are, are best found with a high resolution telescope. And so LSST, where you, where you can pick the images with the best seeing and maybe go to 0.7 arc seconds or something, you can probably find lots of uh, galaxy galaxy type, type lenses but not as many as you would if you went to space. Now the, the area where PS1 and LSST will do very well is in finding the uh, bright and point-like and variable sources. So lens quasars. Here are some lens quasars as seen with Sloan, where the image quality is, is a bit worse. But still, you can see that you can pick out pairs of, uh, of uh, bright blue objects. And if you're lucky, you see a, a lens in between them. If you imagine if, I'd plot, if the pixel scale was different, this would be like a PS1 image rather than a Sloan image, something like that. And down here is a simulation of, uh, of a different kind of point light variable source. This is what a lens supernova would look like with, um, in, in 0.7 arc second seeing. So you see the bright elliptical galaxy, and then here the first image appears of a supernova going off in a, in a faint blue galaxy behind that you don't see. And then you, si you see this one come up, and then a few days later you see this one come up and this one go down and then another one comes up over here, and then one over here. So no one's ever seen anything like this, but uh, we think they might be quite useful. All right, so here's some uh, what we might expect for, for PS1 with the lens quasars. This is a plot I made with, with Masamune Oguri. In orange, you see the distribution of uh, lens galaxy redshifts, and in blue, the distribution of source galaxy redshifts. And in red down here, this is the SLAC survey on the same scale. So these are the 70 lenses with SLACs, and these are the sort of 1 to 2,000 of uh, uh, lenses that you, you find with PS1. And the interesting thing for me here is that there's this tail out to high redshift. So you should have significant numbers of lenses at, at, at redshift greater than 1. So that's lens galaxies, massive galaxies at redshift greater than 1, where the source is an even higher redshift quasar. All right, what about the lens supernovae? Well, if you do the same calculation for, for PS1, you find these curves. This, these are now the, uh, uh, the source redshifts only. These two curves are for core collapse supernovae and type 1a supernovae, as observed in the, the PANSTARS uh, 30,000 square degree survey. And you can see that you might get one lens type 1a supernova, if we're lucky and we don't miss it, and maybe four core collapse survey, uh, supernovae. So I think when, while we might see the first lens supernova with PANSTARS, uh, really LSST would make this a, a, an industrial size sample. So these are the curves that we expect for LSST, just uh, hundreds of, of lens supernova. Okay, so here are three science projects that, that I'm interested in doing with PS1 and, and uh, later with LSST. Uh, obviously there's many, many more you could, you could do, but I can't think of everything. Um, 
So the first one we talked about a bit, the uh, massive galaxy structure and evolution, trying to extend the, the slacks plot to, uh, to higher redshift with more points in here and start to look at um, uh, the masses of galaxies or the mass profiles of galaxies as a function of type and color and environment. And really try and answer this question, you know, is there this conspiracy between um, the stars and the dark matter when the, when the galaxy forms? And really to answer that, you need to go back to the era where these massive galaxies are being assembled. And so Redshift 1 uh, is an interesting era to look at. If you have lens quasars, um, you can also uh, extend the work that, that Neil started in, in the early, uh, early noughties with Chris Cacciano. Um, when you observe the uh, four images in a, in a quad lens system, uh, you expect to be able to predict these uh, uh, fluxes of these images. Uh, fairly accurately. It turns out in some cases uh, you can't do that at all well. And that's because there are, or because we think that there are um, uh, extra small scale clumps of mass in the galaxy, as satellite galaxies, um, which are affecting the magnifications of these images. And so on the left you see this uh, plot from Jörg Diemann's work where you can see these dark matter clumps in orbit around the, around the galaxy. And the question is, uh, are they there? And if they are there, what fraction of them are dark? what fraction of them have managed to form stars, um, is the CDM model really a good one for predicting the, the, the mass functions of uh, halos within halos. And so this is the thing we'd, we'd really like to go and measure. This is the prediction for the uh, number density of, of, or the number of halos per galaxy uh, as a function of their, of their mass. So there's clearly going to be some information there in the statistics of the, of the fluxes of, of lens quasars. Um, we just like to know exactly what we can measure and how well we can do with, uh, with the lens quasar samples coming from PANSARS-1 and LSST. Okay, so final len um, strong lens project we might think of doing um, with LSST and perhaps with PANSARS, but I think this one's for LSST as well, is to uh, measure the, the Hubble constant. So if we go back to this diagram, uh, you can see that the light travels along paths that are of different length actually going through different parts of the potential as well so that the arrival time for the light in each image is different as you saw with the, the, the movie of the, the lens supernova and if your model is good enough then you can predict what these time delays should be but only up to a factor of H0 Hubble's constant and also your predictions will vary on which, cosmo which cosmological model you've assumed for doing the, the distance calculations and so this is a way of probing cosmological parameters it's difficult though you need a lot of data. Um, uh, in particular, uh, you need uh, good quality time delays. So this is for the, the best time delay lens, uh, or the best H0 measuring lens we know of, B1608. This is a um, monitoring campaign done at the VLA by Chris Fasnacht. And the interesting thing here is that, that to get to time delays of uh, precisions of a few days, he needed to take observations with about the LSST cadence. Um, but then also to model the system well, uh, we needed to get very good uh, HST resolution, high resolution follow-up. Um, and so we'd need to find useful uh, lenses and then quickly follow them up with JWST or, or adaptive optics or something. But even if you have time delays with a pre precision of a few days, um, the actual accuracy on, on, on the distance to each lens is, is really determined by how well you understand the, the density environment that the lens lives in. You're not only um, uh, having lensing effect due to the mass in the galaxy, but also all the mass around, and also all the mass along the line of sight. And constraining that is, turns out to be uh, quite difficult, and this is at the moment the dominating uh, systematic. We could hope to learn something from the, from the photometry, from around the, uh, uh, the field, uh, but that's only going to be something uh, relatively crude. What we'd like to do is break this degeneracy between the, the uh, cosmological parameters and the effective slope of the mass profile. And we think you can do this if you have um, a measurement of the magnification as, as, well as, the, um, as well as the image position. And so you need a standard candle, something like a Type 1A supernova. OK. How are we doing, uh, Bruce? Okay, I might even tell you about cosmic strings. Okay, so then just to conclude then this part, I think there's a, there's a lot of strong lensing science uh, you can do with these uh, wide field surveys coming up. 
Um, probably the, the thing we'll learn most about is galaxy structure and evolution. And um, certainly accurate, ma accurate mass measurements in a sample of mass selected galaxies at redshift greater than one is uh, something pretty interesting to look at. Um, I'm hoping to talk with Neil a bit more about this business of measuring uh, cold dark matter substructures. Um, um, and then the cosmography, this has actually come under a little bit of criticism uh, lately from within the gravitational lensing community. People not convinced that you can measure Hubble's constant and it's not worth trying. I think if we try and try hard to measure Hubble's constant, then at the very least we'll do very well on, on measuring galaxy structure and evolution. What's the error though that you would expect typically for Hubble's constant from the computer in this sort of sample? So the statistical error, I think you can get to 5% per system. So the real problem is the, the systematic error from the, from the environment. If that turns out to be mostly zero mean, then, then you win by having large numbers of, of, some, of systems again. But the irreducible part of the, of the error is, is going to be the problem. But I think even so, it's getting towards the sub-percent if you have enough lens supernovae. Oh, oh using supernovae? Yeah. But they're micro lens though, right? I mean, so they are, but only at the beginning. So what happens is that the the microlensing effect from stars in the, in the lens galaxy um, is only important for when the source is, is sort of s small compared to the, the lens caustic due to each star. And so at the beginning when the supernova is small, you get, you're very influenced by the stars in the lens galaxy. But then as the photosphere expands, you, you get less and less affected by that. So the late time light curve should be uh, easy to measure. And then you can hope to try and model the microlensing in the same way that people do for lens quasars and try and back some of it out. But it, it will leave you with an with a uncertainty on the time delay that you can't beat down beyond. But that's still at the few percent level per system. Isn't there a factor of two magnification anomaly that all the lenses that we have, we cannot actually calculate the mag magnification ratios differ from models typically by factor of two for... Uh, yeah, because fraction. most observations we have of lenses are snapshots. So if you just take one image, then you see the effect of the lens, and you see the microlensing effect of all the stars. Well, but the then stars, if these are extended sources, right? So these are quasars, like in the radio or whatever. Mm -hmm. and if you think about the magnification, what do you what you've been doing? What do you call the magnification anomaly? The anomalies you're talking about before, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. right. It's the same effect that then will happen. You know, so, so we know that supernovas will have those issues, right? That if quasars have magnification anomalies, who knows what? Yeah. That means that models are very difficult to make? Well, we also know that not every lens is affected by this. That not every lens is affected by the substructure. So I think what you're saying is that, that you, have to do, you have to do both projects at the same time. You have to uh, try and understand the, the statistics of the, of the substructure, but also understand the, um, try and make the time delay measurements at the same time. Well, another thing you didn't mention is you, you listed a couple of radio surveys. Now, EBLA and ALMA and all these things are coming online. They're supposed to have huge numbers of redshifts of these, you know, star, starburst galaxies at redshift one. And wouldn't those be perfect surveys to... Yeah, yeah, they would. Um, I don't know as much about them. I know SKA was, was uh, expected to do very well for this kind of lensing science. I'm not so sure about ALMA. It's certainly not a survey telescope. So you could think about taking a finder survey in the optical and then, and then following up with, with ALMA. I thought they, they, these guys all meant to do surveys on Starburst, but you've won. That's the goal of ALMA and, and EBLA. I mean, SKA is meant to find the hydrogen atoms and then to do surveys on that. Um, good for more ordinary galaxies. But the big blue guys, I thought, are uh, right up the alley of, um, of EBLA and ALMA, and those are happening like, as we speak. Yeah, yeah, you might be right, but my impression was that the ALMA was was would do high resolution on a sample of, of selected objects rather than surveying the sky at high resolution. Um, I but mean, we should look be at the at going deep on on small fields, but EBLA is certainly planning to survey. Um, I don't know how much, it would certainly be interesting to see whether, whether the numbers for ALMA and EBLA match up to, to what we expect for, for these surveys. I know for SKA it was, it was comparable or better for, than, the, than the optical imaging surveys because with SKA you can go both wide and deep and high resolution. Um, but I think the, the numbers that I, that I have in my head are for a, 
uh, for a, maybe an, an older design of SKA. So I'd be interested in, in, in seeing what the current design of SKA could do. Yeah, I think you might be better off with these high frequency instruments than with SKA, not, not just because they are um, coming online like right now, but also because they target these blue galaxies that you're looking at anyways, like with a much higher density. Yeah, yeah, you might be right, you might be right. Yeah. I think for the for the, the quasar stuff where you where you're trying to find the small number of high redshift lenses, then you need to go to a very wide field survey just to get the numbers of lens quasars up. So for that I think you we need to find a a high frequency very wide field survey. Okay. We're on to the bonus slides. Sorry? Strings? Strings, yeah, okay. So I wasn't planning to talk this fast. I was a bit wary about showing people the stuff we're doing on cosmic strings because they're slightly disreputable. But anyway, um, the idea is that if you have a, a, a cosmic string, it's a bit like a, a dislocation in, in space time. And uh, they seem to be coming out of uh, uh, string and brain theories fairly generically. And so we should try and uh, look for them in the data. Uh, here's a simulation of a, of a string network through, uh, uh, through space time. You can see these uh, uh, long strings that survive uh, and span the, the Hubble volume. Uh, so what are the properties of a, of a cosmic string? Well, you can, uh, you can ask how, much, how many strings could there be there that influenced uh, the formation of, of structure in the universe i.e. what effect would they have on the uh, cosmic, microwave bio, uh, cosmic microwave background power spectrum. And so here's a plot of uh, what cosmic strings do compared to what we actually see in, in the data. And then you can say, well, what, what must the string tension be uh, uh, as low as in order for this not to be affected? And you find that the tension, which is this uh, fundamental microscopic uh, physics parameter, has to be less than some number like 3 times 10 to the minus 7. So we think I if strings are out there, and the theorists expect them to be, then they're uh, uh, low, low tension and, and low density, maybe uh, a dozen of them across the sky. So that's sort of a, something of a prediction to, to aim at. It turns out cosmic strings act, can act as gravitational lenses, um, uh, but not the, the usual kind of lens where you have um, uh, multiple imaging that's uh, inverted, there's a parity uh, inversion. Um, and the uh, magnification will be different for each image. Uh, when you have lensing by a cosmic string, you just get two copies of the same thing translated like this. Here's a picture from, uh, from Sajin's, uh, Sajin's paper. And so we can ask, uh, uh, can we make a, uh, a robot to find these automatically in high resolution images? And so as a sideline to Hagwell's, we've been, uh, we've been doing this in the HST archives. Is that generic? I mean, like this, uh, this property as opposed to just to translation? I mean, so for straight strings, I guess this is true. I mean, I mean is there a Yeah, I think, I think you, need, you need to have a string that is straight over the, the, length, the size of an image. So in the stuff that I show you, we're specifically making that assumption. In fact, we're doing more than that. We're saying there has to be string o uh, straight over the size of a field. Okay, so you can try and find strings via their lensing effect in the CMB as well, where uh, you not only get a, a translation, but you also get a small uh, redshift difference between either side of the string. Now, for optical images, it's not going to be detectable, but, but for the CMB, maybe you could. And so people have tried to find strings directly in the CMB, and at the moment, they're just limited by the resolution. There just aren't any high-resolution CMB uh, surveys around. Um, but in the optical, there's been uh, a claim of a, of a cosmic string as a gravitational lens. Here it is. Uh, this was in ground, a ground-based survey, and with HST follow-up, it turned out to be a pair of elliptical galaxies. You can see that they're different shapes, they're not translated image, uh, images. Um, the thing is that these are two bright galaxies, but we already expect um, most strong lenses to have faint blue galaxies as their sources. <coughs> so we started thinking about how many um, uh, multiply imaged, string-lensed faint blue galaxies we might see in a high-resolution survey and did some calculations as to, as to what we might expect. And it turns out that you don't need a very big survey to say something uh, interesting in the sense that um, if your resolution is high enough to pick out the splitting of the images, then 
then you don't need very much sky to be able to rule out um, certain string tensions. Okay, so Eric Morganson is the student working on this at Stanford. He made this simulation of, uh, of uh, an image with a string in it. I don't know if you can see it, but yeah, it's there. And so here are the things that uh, you expect to see. So pairs of images just translated on each other, or sliced up, translated. And he's been uh, putting together a, a little uh, software robot to find uh, things that look like this. So here's what he does. He, he finds all pairs of faint blue galaxies, and then he uh, associates them together. So he's got here two galaxies, and if you assume that they've been lensed by a cosmic string, then here's where the string would go, and it has some angle relative to the vertical and some distance from the origin. And so you can take every single pair of blue galaxies and, and rotate to this uh, huff space, and then plot out the... Uh, the distance to the origin from the uh, and the angle of the of the string, and so a string in a field like this would appear here, and a string in a field like this would appear here, a string like this would appear here, and you see where there is actually a string, there's a big detection here. So this is his method for finding strings. He hasn't found any yet, so if it continues to be the case that he hasn't found any cosmic strings in the HST archive, here are the limits that he would find on the string tension, and so. If you uh, look in the good survey, you, you would do as well down to here. This is string tension along this axis and um, something like uh, the density of strings in space up that, that side. And the thing about the density is that we're uh, fairly sure from, the, from the, the models that it's less than this line here. And so you can see you need something like the size of the archive to push down below that value and start to say something about the, the string tension. And then this is, uh, again, for, for SNAP or, or something like JDEM, if you could do the same survey, but on 1,000 square degrees, you might be able to push down to, to limits like this. So there you go. No strings yet in the HST. But 10 7 would correspond to um, 5 milli arc seconds splitting. Do you think this method is sensitive to a displacement of the image by 5 milli arc seconds? Five milli arc seconds? No, I, I don't think that's, uh, that's right. Well, I think the the, this way. limit here yeah. is the angular resolution limit for, for HST. Oh, but that's... Well, you're using, but splitting, the exact displacement of a displaying is exactly g mu in radians. So the g mu over z squared of you know, one arc second is 2 times 10 minus... is uh, 5 times 10 minus 6 right, for one arc second. Yeah, so that's... I think what you're saying is that I should check my numbers, but but Eric made this plot and he says that the angular resolution limit for, for the HST archive is is 0.3 arc seconds, and that must correspond to this line here. So maybe we're missing some factors of a few or something. Yeah, but that is one, one times 10 minus 6 if you have one arc second, right? In 0.3 arc seconds, it's, it's pretty close to one hundred million radians. We should check afterwards. Yeah. We can phone him up. I mean, I know that there are factors of a few that come in from um, the distribution of, of splitting angles you have according to the inclination of the string. So. All right, now I really have exhausted all my slides. <laughs> No, I don't. But there, there'd be two, right? There's the, w there's the number that you get from the... Statistical and density direct search. But both of them must be, put, must be better than we have now by at least an order of magnitude. 
Yeah, yeah, I would think so. But this, this I think, is the, is the, the best direct limit on the string density. So there is some difference between measuring things statistically at redshift uh, 1,000 and measuring things directly uh, right here. So this is a, it's worth something if not very much. Yeah, um, so is the fraction of the spirals that you were finding that were in high level surprising? Um, I think it's surprising for someone who's only ever modeled lenses as isothermal spheres. I think once you have, once you make models that have all this, you know, stellar mass in the disk projected so that along the line of sight, then I think you can you can boost the cross section a little more. Which but we're also we're even trained to find spirals, right? I mean, it no, it's finding it's finding the seeing the bulges, and then and then detecting you know little uh, residuals around them. But I'm pretty sure that none of those none of those um, uh, spiral lenses are given a, a high val a high classification parameter by the robot. It, it took the humans to sifting through the, all the probables to say, oh, yeah, well, this is actually is a lens. Okay, so there is a point of humans still. Yeah. Yeah. Really? So uh, I'm having numbers in front of me. We did, we did some copies from the limits about the CDI associated with things. That's what you put me. And building up alone is, so it depends a lot on the model. It's not, it's not a new prediction. I would think ACT and SBT do rather better on the on the direct detection like this, because even Planck is is still a six arc minute beam or something. Yeah. 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 Thank you.